I do want to thank our, our speakers, um, Professor Marion and Dr. Neal. Thank you so much for your time today and sharing that information with, with our attendees today. Um, so I'm going to actually turn it over to Carly Hotbet. Um, she's going to be moderating our next panel. So I'll introduce just a quick uh, introduction of our panelists um, for lessons learned in developing sustainable food systems. Um, we're going to have Carly Hotbet, who's the uh, Associate Director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas. We also get to hear from Dave Carter of Crystal Spring Consulting, Chris Roper of Indigenous Agriculture LLC, and James Madsen of Madsen Consulting, and we'll give some time for them to introduce themselves as well, but I will turn it over to Carly, who I believe has a brief presentation. Great. Thanks, Whitney. Good to see you um, and very excited to be presenting here today on this lessons learned um, developing native food systems and to be a moderator for this panel. Um, with that, um, I would love to share my screen and kind of go through a few slides to get everybody prepped and be able to talk about um, our panelists experiences in the work that they've done in developing native food systems and working in Indian country and providing the type of consultation and partnership services that are really necessary to see successful ag operations in Indian country because we know we're different than some mainstream businesses or organizations or ag operations and there's additional considerations that really need to be um, thoughtfully uh, considered and implemented when uh, doing planning, feasibility study, execution, implementation, and all that good stuff that's necessary when we're working through those systems. So with that, I will go ahead and share my screen. Great. All right. Um, if you could give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can see this screen, that I would appreciate that. Perfect. Okay. Great. Let me go through that. So I um, kind of went through that. Just I work for the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative. Um, we partner with a lot of tribal organizations that are working in the field. Um, we were founded at the uh, University of Arkansas School of Law, and we are still there um, and love our um, work that we do with the university. And I am trying to get this chat window out of my way, and it is not working very well. So let me Wait one second. There we go. Still not working. Okay. Can you guys see the chat window as well or no? Mm -hmm. oh, we just see your presentation. Okay, perfect. I won't worry about that then. Great. Um, so found at the University of Arkansas School of Law by our Dean Emeritus, Stacey Leeds, um, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and is a um, very stellar professor in the area of federal Indian law and our founding director, Janie Simsip, which we are very proud of her um, in her recent confirmation to be general counsel at USDA. So very thrilled for the work that she's been going on. Um, she also founded NAF, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. So she is just all over the place and building infrastructure for Indian country. And our mission is to enhance health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and really supporting those cultural food traditions in Indian country that are so important to us. And a little bit about our work, we touch on model tribal food and ag code. We are the research partner for the Native Farm Bill Coalition, which you just heard our previous speaker um, before Whitney mention uh, about the great work that's been done and really um, provided support for Indian country agriculture expansion and development. Um, we do work in native food safety. We just wrapped our seventh or eighth um, food and ag leadership summit for native youth last week. And we were virtual this past year, but hopefully we'll be in person next year. We do cultivating food sovereignty, help food and ag operations in Indian country scale up, provide policy research and analysis for tribal hemp, and then also food security and access. So we really cover a lot of bases and intend to serve our partners um, and our stakeholders in whatever area of tribal um, agriculture that they are particularly interested in. So a little bit of background about the state of American Indian and Alaska Native farms per the 2017 um, ag census. We make up about 3% of all farms in the US. And but our market value of ag products um, increased by um, over nine percent from about three and a quarter billion to three and a half billion. Um, and we're looking to see a similar increase um, at the next uh, census of agriculture. So it's a great time to be involved in Indian country ag. We're seeing significant growth in the industry. 
Um, we've had an increase in the number of producers from 56,000 to 60,000, a 7% increase in the number of farms that have been counted. Um, increase in tree and nut farming by 24%, increase in sheep and goat farming by 34%, beef and cattle ranching has increased by 20%, um, and then our greenhouse nursery and floriculture farming has increased as well. I would anticipate seeing similar increases um, in the next iteration of the Ag Census, especially since we have more people that are aware of and understand the importance of participating in the census and identifying themselves as um, Indigenous producers. So really, we're seeing, you know, a big increase. Like we hit on some of these numbers, um, but likely these numbers are still undercounted. So it's really important to make sure to share that because if we don't have data, we can't make the decisions and we can't make educated decisions and we can't leverage the resources and make the best decisions for our individual operations. So I want to give you all that context and tell you a little bit about me. And we're going to be talking about some of the lessons learned that we've uh, been engaged in as far as the work that we all have done on this panel in Indian country. So as Whitney said, I'm the current associate director of IFAI. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, so Osio Nagata. Uh, I'm an attorney. I have a master's degree in public administration, and my undergrad is in ag business and political science. Um, grew up raising uh, show pigs on the Cherokee Nation Reservation, and then went to Oklahoma State and continued my ag endeavors um, from that perspective. So actually, I'm going to back up here real quick. Hang on one second. Um, there we go. So before I got to IFAI, um, I was just practicing law, doing my thing, and had the opportunity to go work in-house for Muskogee Creek Nation. And while I was there, I caught a grant that came across my desk that wasn't very well written and involved the ag and natural resources operations of the nation and knew it was not implementable as drafted, just based on my experience in agriculture and understanding of some of the um, challenges associated with ag operations in Indian country, especially in a rural area with um, labor constraints and infrastructure constraints. So I took it to the Secretary of Interior Affairs at the time and said, hey, I don't think we can make this work. I'm not going to recommend that this be put through. And so he said, well, why don't you come over and clean up our, our ag programs? And after I had graduated from law school, I thought that, you know, there wasn't going to be an opportunity for me to get back involved into agriculture and work in tribal government like I wanted. And so it meant stepping away from the practice of law, but I had the opportunity to gain some management experience and really see if I could apply some of my knowledge base to benefit um, my employer tribe. So I thought, all right, let's do it. I came in and we, <laughs> the programs were very siloed, um, very insular, not very much transparency and kind of financially in a wreck. So by leveraging my agribusiness knowledge, my, um, knowledge in um, government and public administration in political science and then my law degree i was able to identify where we had deficits in meeting our statutory requirements under muskogee creek nation law and then also where we had opportunities to kind of clean up some of the losses that were coming along with that operation um, all that to say in the first year of operation we were able to cut the loss margin by 70 percent by vertically integrating the farm inputs to um, feed and forage for the cattle operation so that alone really cleaned up stuff um, i was able to put together a really good team i hired uh, people who were very knowledgeable in the areas that i particularly wasn't knowledgeable in like the day-to-day -day operations of a cattle um, operation that's not something that i'm particularly well versed in but i know people who know that so <laughs> making sure that you're bringing on the right staff is important and making sure that you are identifying your own gaps in knowledge and seeking solutions to address that um, is key as well in addition to um, you know, putting a good team together, I knew that we needed to reorganize um, and actually create a division of agriculture. Um, and so we were able to put forth legislation to do that and also seek additional funding um, from tribal council to be invested in those ag operations in order to buy uh, more quality cattle and also do some maintenance and infrastructure. We implemented um, a better cow-calf operation. We eliminated some of the row crops that were attempting to be farmed on a 300-acre parcel, which you can't make any money trying to do 300 acres of soybeans. And nobody said anything. <laughs> they just assumed that that was fine and that was an okay operation. Um, 
we had equipment that was not consistent with um, the operations. So we were able to offload a lot of that and then um, really kind of turned it around. So very happy with that. In the second or third year that we were there, though, we had a uh, government wide strategic plan that was um, put together and had an experience with a consultant that was very business minded and not sure that they had um, any prior experience in, in Indian country or agriculture. And that became apparent when we were giving our presentation about what our intended strategic plan was going to be for the Division of Ag and Natural Resources. And we were asked if we had any, uh, had considered any tax implications associated with our operation. And I had to explain, this is a tribal operation. All of the operations are on trust land within the reservation boundaries. We're not subject to state tax law and we're not subject um, really to federal um, taxation either under those considerations. So there was a gap in knowledge there. The other gap in knowledge was the funding um, considerations. You know, where does the money come from? And statutorily, the operations there at the nation were intended to be self-sustaining and revenue generating. And that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later um, in my slide presentation as far as, you know, some of the things that you need to consider. But government funding cycles look a lot different than um, a business funding cycle. And so this particular operation was housed under the government umbrella. Um, other tribal operations in agriculture are maybe held under a business arm um, or are a separate LLC that um, the tribe is the sole owner of. So as far as, you know, how that funding flows and what your accounting um, you know, uh, cycles look like there are some significant funding considerations associated with that and how you balance out your budget. Um, how do you, what do you do when uh, council doesn't get a budget passed and you're on a continuing resolution that funds at a quarterly level, but you buy your feed in bulk at the beginning of the year? You know, those are some of the things to really think about when you're looking at, you know, business planning structures. So very happy um, with that. Um, the person that I hired to come up under me uh, is now in the um, director position that I held there at the nation and they Muskogee Creek Nation under his leadership is bringing on a meat processing facility. So very proud to see that all the work that was done um, is being continued and is not allowed, has been allowed to fall, fall, fall by the wayside, which, you know, we see that when, when there are um, changes in administration and you maybe will lose the um, policymaker that is really supporting your um, ag operations and endeavors. So sustainability of operations is something to consider from a political perspective as well, not just an operational perspective. So with that, I kind of want to highlight our panelists. Um, I'm very happy to have my friend Chris Roper join me, um, newly formed Indigenous Agriculture LLC. Um, Chris has a lot of experience in construction, uh, planning and design, and then tribal meat processing facilities. Those are the highlights. He is much more multifaceted than that, but I will let him introduce himself further on. Um, we also have Dave Carter joining us from Crystal Springs Consulting, uh, focusing on organic and sustainable agriculture. I'm really excited to hear about alternative livestock marketing opportunities, um, especially considering some of the uh, supply chain disruptions that we've had during COVID impacts. So I know a lot of people have been looking towards local producers um, to source their protein, their animal proteins, rather than getting in them at the grocery store. Um, and then uh, certification assistance for your organic um, and other types of um, ag value add certifications that we're looking for there. Um, James Matson is also joining us today with Matson Consulting, focusing on small and mid-sized operations and really looking at opportunities for partners to leverage USDA funding resources, um, specializing in feasibility studies, business plans, and strategic planning, kind of like we just talked about, but with more appropriate um, perspectives with regard to Indian country and ag specific operations. And then also food hubs. I'm really excited to hear about food hub opportunities as well. So all of that to say, myself and our panelists, you know, have experience in working with tribes and in tribal government, have ag, ag subject matter expertise, have some legal and regulatory knowledge, um, know how to leverage stakeholder and policy buy-in, but also have a really good understanding of tribal business structures. All of that to say, it should not take somebody like myself, an indigenous attorney with four degrees to figure out how to be successful in tribal ag business. It's ridiculous that, you know, it took that long and the operations had continued, you know, for that length of time without somebody coming in and saying, this isn't working. Um, so we really need to make sure that we are hiring the right people that have the right 
expertise that have the right access and know how to really make things work in Indian country. I'm going to whip through these next few slides because I want to make sure we hear from our panelists. But uh, how to pick your partners, green flags, experience in working with tribes and tribal governments, that ag subject matter expertise, that legal and regulatory knowledge, all that stuff that we just talked about, red flags, no prior experience in Indian country at all. Um, not even, you know, living on the res or anything like that. Um, no prior experience in agriculture. You can't just roll up and know what you're doing. Ag is a very um, nuanced uh, economy and industry and even broken down to the type of production operations that you're engaging in. There is particular uh, knowledge associated with that. And then also beware of partners or consultants that don't listen. Um, if your partners or consultants are not able to receive feedback, are not able to um, receive questions about um, their particular skills or qualifications or prior experience, um, that's something to be concerned about. Um, and some of those topics of concern, obviously tribal sovereignty, how can we preserve that without um, having to give up too much of it to be able to do the things that we wanna do? Uh, land use considerations, trust, leveraging trust land versus restricted land versus fee land. Those are all things that your consultant um, either should be knowledgeable about or be willing to learn um, where your funding sources and what your funding cycles look like. What kind of historical policy impacts have happened? The majority of us um, living and working um, in Indian country as indigenous persons have historically been separated from many, most, or all of our traditional food sources, especially removed tribes that were taken from their homeland locations and relocated um, mostly to Oklahoma um, and other places. So um, what, as a Cherokee citizen, what was you know, traditional for um, Southeastern Woodlands tribes is maybe not necessarily something that we could access similarly in Oklahoma. So there are, there are contextual historical implications associated with our operations. How do we leverage federal resources specific to tribes or even not specific to tribes? Um, relationship building, so important in Indian country. How do we know we can trust you? Um, what's your goal definition? And this is something that really worries me when I work in Indian country because you hear we want to um, have a revenue generating operation that's sustainable and um, provides good jobs for people and returns value to our tribal community. Those are four different things. And an operation can do all of those things, but it's really important to prioritize which one is the most important. Um, because frequently, if you have something that's a revenue generating goal, you want to make money and return that money to the tribe, um, you need to make sure that those other secondary or subsidiary goals are not getting in the way of that primary goal because it can very much be derailed. I had to tell people no sometimes because we they people will come when I was working for Muskogee Creek Nation asking, can you donate some cattle for um, this particular um, endeavor or fundraiser or you know, meal? I had to say no, because statutorily we're required to be revenue generating. And being able to understand and prioritize what your goals are is very important. Other questions of concern. Do we need to be concerned about tax implications? If your consultant is hammering on about you know, leveraging you know, tax opportunities, maybe they're not the best fit for you. There are things to consider, especially if you're leveraging tax credits through an exchange program that could be of importance, but generally, you know, how do, how do we approach that? That's something that your consultant should know about. Um, how involved should your external or non-tribal community be? Maybe not at all. Um, and what kind of local laws or codes apply? If you have a consultant that is saying, hey, you need to be really focused on this type of building code or, um, you know, this type of local um, utility infrastructure jurisdiction and you're building on trust land, that's not the same thing. Um, are you occupying the regulatory space? Are you going to be engaging in a new endeavor? Um, but maybe you also need to adopt some tribal code to go with that, to really support that and make that as feasible and viable so that you don't have external regulators attempting to interfere or intervene in your operations within um, your lands. And then what's your existing network and structure? How do you um, operate from a government perspective? Who are your decision makers? Who do you need to get buy-in from? Um, questions like that. Here's a list of some tribally specific needs and issues that our consultants probably have had some opportunity to um, intervene with as far as food deserts, needing to really scale up your local tribal production agriculture, um, expand your existing tribal operations, increase those market shares through value added opportunities, and then how to really address access to markets or develop the markets that you need and 
you know, are lacking infrastructure, challenges with underproductive lands or underproductive natural resources that are in need of conservation and things that we've all experienced over the last year and a half, unreliable supply chains. So I would encourage you um, to check out some of the resources available um, at IFAI. This is one that I've developed. It's called a resource bank for informed goal setting. It really allows you to put together an inventory of all the things listed here as far as lands, building, equipment, expertise, um, et cetera. But that's available on our um, EATS, E-A-T-S link there on our website at, at indigenousfoodandag.com. But this is a really good tool just to kind of assemble everything that you have to help make um, decisions about that. We also have a mind map for decision making. You know, if you wanted to start a Department of Agriculture, what that would look like from a government perspective and walking through some of the questions and answers. And we also put together some sample organization charts about, you know, how you could structure a Department of Agriculture or where your ag operations could live within a government structure. So we help through, you know, planning goal setting, funding opportunity, and we have a ton of, you know, attorneys and federal with federal and tribal experience and then, um, you know, policy and food and ag program and expertise. So reach out to us. All of our services are free and we're happy to collaborate with any other consultant or partner that you bring on as well to really get your operation off the ground. And this is our final slide with all of our contact information. And I'm happy to share this so we can circulate it later. But with that, I wanted to turn it over um, to our next panelist. Um, I believe, I'm not sure, I don't have the agenda in front of me, um, but if Dave or Chris or James wants to volunteer to go next. I'm happy to turn it over to who's up. <laughs> well, I guess I was first on the agenda, so I'll, I'll jump in here. Thank you very much, Carly. I appreciate it. And that was a great overview. Kind of sets the stage for, for uh, things this morning. Um, and also really honored to be with Chris and, and, and James. They're great folks. Um, and finally, give a shout out to, to Dr. Merrigan, um, who's been a real pioneer in the uh, organic alternative egg and co-op movement. Just to give you a little bit of my background, when it talks about lessons learned, I guess I've been around for, for a little while. Uh, prior to 2001, I spent 25 years with the national, with the Farmers Union organization. And I was a field organizer for the National Farmers Union in the 1980s when we were in the depths of the farm crisis. And coming out of that, uh, we really saw that producers wanted to, to take control, more control over their own destiny. And so we saw the, the rise of what was called co-op fever at the time, a, a real a resurgent in, in co-op development uh, across the, the American heartland. Um, I served as president of the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, a regional organization in Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico in the 1990s. And, and because of the interest in co-op development, we organized a uh, cooperative development center there to help foster the development of co-ops. And I'm pleased to say that uh, co-op development center is still continuing and in, in particularly in cooperation with USDA's rural development. Um, but in 2001, I made several changes. Uh, thanks in part to Dr. Merrigan, I ended up on the National Organic Standards Board and, and was chair when the organic standards came in place in 2002. Um, I began to serve part-time as the director of the National Bison Association, uh, representing about 1,200 ranchers and uh, marketers across the country and, and have worked to, um, we have now a formal memorandum of understanding with the Intertribal Buffalo um, <clears throat> uh, Council and have worked together on many projects on, on bison restoration over the last several years. And then I've uh, served as a consultant with Crystal Springs Consulting, uh, the principal of that, and um, worked, gosh, everything from working with Southern States Cooperative in, in the Southeast to working with uh, crop or organic valley co-op in the last few years to connect with a, a co-op in the United Kingdom to bring organic uh, cheese, uh, English cheddar into the US. And then in the last few years, I've had the pleasure of working with Native American Agriculture Fund and be involved in some projects. The Osage Nation uh, was up in the Blackfeet Nation and uh, Fort Peck last week in working on a, a project in the Southwest Intertribal. So um, the thing that you know I have learned through the years is that when it comes to, to cooperative development, uh, the environment has to be right. 
we saw that in, in the 1980s when there was the co-op fever and, and the development of co-ops at that time, because there was a recognition that we needed to do something different. Well, we're at one of those uh, inflection points right now. You know, when you think about it, the perception that many, many people have with food has really evolved through the years. We've seen that the organic industry has risen in large part because people are starting to make a connection between their diet and health. They're starting to make a connection between their diet and, and the health of the environment. And in my work with the National Bison Association and as a bison rancher, we're seeing that play out, that people are beginning to realize what I put in my body affects how well I live and how well the earth is going to survive. Well, those have been evolving for the last several years, but we saw then the pandemic, COVID-19, really accelerated many of those changes. Coming through the pandemic, there is even higher recognition. Uh, people felt, you know, they felt disjointed. They, they, they felt out of control over the last year. And so the one thing they could do is control what they put into their body and, and try and take some ownership of that. And we're seeing right now that those um, trends are continuing. I like to say that COVID really, uh, it, to use the Wizard of Oz analogy, it ripped back the curtain on the myth of the resiliency of the industrialized concentrated food system. When we saw that uh, the pandemic swept through those large uh, meat processing plants and left then retail stores bare and you had hog farmers and poultry growers that had to euthanize animals, that was really a realization of how unresilient that system is. And I think that that's going to continue moving forward. The Food Marketing Institute, for example, just put out a, a new report here about three months ago about grocery shopper trends. And one of the things that I found really interesting in that was they asked the question, when it comes to my health, I trust fill in the blank. Well, number th one, two, and three were families, friends, and doctors. But right below that is number four was farmers. You had to go down to about 18 or 19 before you got to food manufacturers. And so there's an opportunity right now, farmers and ranchers um, are a trusted source of, of information. And when you think then about tribal producers, the halo of, of the concept that tribal producers have been the stewards of this land for years and years and years, have been stewards of the, the herds of bison, that there is an opportunity for brand equity, tribal brand equity that we can take forward into the marketplace. And so that's why I think that it's really the, the timing of NAF's document, reimagining tribal food economies, where they talk about the development of the tribal food hubs um, is really significant because that builds on what Dr. Merrigan was talking about, what she tried to start years ago under the Obama administration of know your farmer, know your food. But the tribal food hubs, the whole idea of regional food hubs is a way of bringing that forward into the marketplace. And so that as we do that, um, I think we have to take a look at then how do we start to develop those, those food hubs? And those are the discussions that we've had down in, in uh, Osage country and, and up in the, the Blackfeet Nation and down in the Southwest, is this vision of a food hub that might even be with an online where somebody's ordering a product, but if they're ordering it in Oklahoma City, it's, it's coming out of a Osage or a Quapaw facility. If they're ordering it in Boise, Idaho, it may be coming out of a, a Blackfeet facility. So there's that opportunity for us to work together. And then when we think about that, um, Dr. Merrigan really put it succinctly when she said that co-ops are about equity. It's how do we create this new food economy in an equitable manner? And that's where um, the discussion that we had earlier, and I think Chris is going to, to talk about this more at length, is it really starts with cooperation as a small C and not cooperative development as a large C. 
is that we really have to have the culture and the commitment to work together and have those shared values and to cooperate on the goal and then to take a look what's the best business structure to help us develop that. And that's then what can lead us into the development of a more formal cooperative. But I think along the process, then as we work together um, within the, the intertribal community is to talk about some ways that we can cooperate in sourcing and in processing in bringing our products to market. Because particularly in my background is working more in the, in the meat sector is that it's not just building a bricks and mortar processing plant and then build it and they will come is that it really has to be a coordinated approach that connects the supply of animals that the producers have out there with the consumer demand in the marketplace and addresses all of the facets, particularly two of them that I think are critical is the distribution. How do we get those products distributed into the marketplace? And is there an opportunity for distribution cooperatives? But then also those of us in the meat sector know that it's the utilization of the carcass. And how do we work on utilizing some of the things like the offall and, and those byproducts and develop those into some products so that we really are honoring the animals and using all parts. So that's really the, the overview um, in terms of what I think is the environment that we have out there today and the opportunity. So I'll turn it over. I think Chris is next on the agenda and I'll let him take it from there. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. I'm glad to, glad to be with you all today, and I'm honored to uh, you know uh, to, to have worked with uh, most everyone on the panel here. I'm, I'm very fortunate to uh, have been able to work with Janie Hip, and we've all congratulated her. And you know, one of her uh, you know most recent uh, sayings that we want to remember her with today is that. You have to cooperate before you can have a cooperative. If you're not willing to cooperate, uh, it's going to be really hard to have a cooperative. So, uh, you know, Janie mentioned that not long ago on a call we had, and I thought that was important to mention, and, and we'll continue to hit on that more as, uh, as we go through the afternoon here. But as Dave mentioned, I'm Chris Roper. I, uh, I spent many years working with the Quapaw Nation, uh, building their agricultural programs. Um, you know, we worked with uh, beef programs, bison programs. Uh, we had our own meat program. Uh, we, we did start our own meat processing facility back in 2017. I've since left Quapaw Nation and have been fortunate enough to be able to work with uh, tribes all across the nation. We have projects going on in uh, the state of Washington, in uh, Oregon. Uh, we have a few in Oklahoma. Uh, we have uh, worked with tribes in North Carolina, Virginia. Uh, and even up in Rhode Island. So we're uh, fortunate to be available and fortunate to have some previous experience that is we're able to share with tribes that are doing all types of projects. You know, uh, a lot of greenhouse facilities going up, uh, you know, canning facilities, a lot of meat processing facilities, the feasibility study phases, uh, some in the construction phase now. As Dave mentioned, we did uh, work with the Osage for, uh, tribe in Oklahoma and we got a facility open there in uh, at the end of the year right around the first of January. Uh, I was fortunate to have a call this morning with uh, a Carly's predecessor at Muscogee Creek Nation. They gave me an update on their facility and that that uh, Muscogee Creek Nation facility will be open in uh, this fall. So that'll be another tribal facility that uh, is on the market. Uh, they are uh, uh, have a little bit different structure. They are focusing on, you know, beef, bison, pork, uh, as well as deer. Deer was very important to that tribe, and they wanted to make sure that they were uh, offering that service to all their tribe members. Uh, the Osage Nation did that as well, making sure that they were uh, offering a service that their tribe members could use, and, and, and uh, frankly, a service that deteriorated during the, the COVID pandemic. There were a lot of small meat processors that stopped uh, processing deer because of the, such a high demand with the beef, pork, and bison market. So we're seeing a lot of demands in a lot of different areas. Uh, you know, the Osage tribe had just uh, finished another greenhouse facility with a small distilling operation that can make hand sanitizer. Um, you know, they have about 80,000 feet of greenhouse facility there, and even Carly was able to work on that, uh, developing some food codes for the Osage Nation. 
that is extremely important to make sure that we get the structure right on your operation. Each tribe is different uh, in the way that they set up their operations and the way they set up their businesses. Um, you know, you want to make sure you have procedures in place as you bring on your key people so that you can monitor progress, you can monitor successes, uh, and you can monitor things that may not work so well. And you want to be able to catch those early, catch them swiftly, and get them corrected. So we were able to help with those uh, along the pro along the way. Um, and, you know, we're here to help. And, you know, with when you're talking about cooperatives, uh, I've been fortunate to work with Dave uh, in the bison markets and the National Bison Association, where we see a lot of different attitudes when it comes to cooperatives. And what it really comes down to on these cooperatives is people cooperating, uh, no different than any any contract. It takes it takes people to cooperate together to be able to understand uh, what needs to happen, who's going to do what. And it also takes trust. It takes uh, you know those those open conversations and those good relationships to be able to work together and to have a long term relationship. Uh, we can see, uh, you know, each year tribes face uh, elections and turnover in, in their administrations. Uh, we need to be able to build sustainable facilities and sustainable plans that can withstand turnover in a tribal administration. Um, Carly's mentioned that earlier, and that's extremely important. I think we a lot of us have seen that. And uh, you, you, you owe that to your people. You owe that to your employees and you owe that to your business to have a plan that can sustain, uh, you know, turnover. And uh, we need some succession planning once you do have a business going. Uh, and again, Carly mentioned all the different services that the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Group have. Uh, they're great to work with. And so please reach out to these organizations, the uh, Indigenous Ag Group. Uh, they have great youth programs. They have great technical outreach and assistance that's available. So please feel free to reach out to any one of us on the panel or to any one of the organizations that are participating here. Uh, NAF keeps growing in their outreach, uh, the grants. Um, you know, we're working on the regional food distribution models and we want everyone to pay attention to that and to, and to raise your hand and assist uh, if you feel like you have capabilities that can be beneficial to this regional food distribution model. If you have the drive and the ambition to want to participate in something greater than just your small area or your small tribal community, then please let people know and uh, make that known. So, you know, with that, I want to uh, let, let James have his time and then uh, we'll uh, go back to Carly on the panel and see who has good questions and what we can elaborate on even further. Thank you. Definitely, and just wanted to take this transition time to remind people if you have questions, um, you know, go ahead and uh, drop those in the chat or get them uploaded to the Google Doc form. We definitely want, would like to hear from you and be able to answer your questions. And with that, I will turn it over to James. Sorry to interrupt and take it away. Perfect. Good morning. This is uh, Jim Matson. Um, my work, I uh, past history, I worked at USDA doing cooperative development. I spent the last 20 years on my own with a, with a firm uh, here in South Carolina. And we work a lot with our co-op development centers on that, doing local foods, food hubs, setting up that, as well as working with a lot of uh, meat processing as part of that food system approach. And in that, we've been fortunate with, to work with lots of uh, tribal nations and lots of projects, and we have several going on. But I want to focus for time-wise on some of the advice on the on the project side and less about me on it. So um, the thought I wanted, I wanted to reiterate when you're looking at these food projects was again, that uh, on the co-op side that to be careful of the somebody should mentality. So sort of mentioning it is, you know, looking around that room and saying somebody should be the one to focus that. And to really uh, reiterating what the other panelists have done, it's always scary when you're the third person, which is such all scare people talking. But, um, you know, focusing on the leadership and who's gonna step, because a lot of times on these meat processing and other food ventures are really one of the key areas is sustaining a clear leadership that you can be able to grow with the group, set up and cutting it. Um, what I've been told on meat processing work is a lot of times the difference from success and failure is uh, that, that just, if you can cut your meat up that amount to a higher value cut, you make money. If you go the opposite way, you lose money. 
So when you're looking at meat processing, you know, it's not the question about where you're going to sell the, the T-bones. Really, it comes down to where you're going to sell the offal. You know, you need to sell everything but the smell is kind of one of the slogans, but you get down to that. It's, you know, you're looking at a low margin business when you're trying to do it on the front end, but what can you add to it? What value can you bring? The further away you get from putting the knife to the animal, the more money you can retain, you know, doing smoking, selling that in, uh, branding, you know, really building a brand when, you know, you're taking advantage of that, you know, indigenous trust and, land, and brand to bring that, that trust to the land back to the consumer. The other thing is, is trying to fill the holes that you can fill on the tribal nation. A lot of, a lot of areas have been, you know, into food deserts and are, you know, importing uh, sodas and potato chips and not really having that local production network. So building that network where you can provide it, where you provide more value as you're going in. And I always feel like the USDA talks a lot about value added, which I think is the wrong term. I think what you want is value retained. You want to look at what can you keep there, but also not always in terms of dollars, but what can you build with the young folks? Sometimes in these you know, food system projects, you're also starting with the sales, but you're also starting back with the schools, you know, training the youth, beginning to, to change that focus on what is good food, you know, how to prepare it, how to bring back in, bringing that cultural aspect into it and doing that thing all the way through the process. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a big super you're kind of looking at and having different pieces focus on it, you know. But that being said, for the, you know, the co-op side, in order to make the co-op work at the end of the day, sustainability, you have to be able to pay your bills at the end of the month. You know, no matter what it is, no matter how good or lofty the ideal is, if you can't cover your bills, you know, you can't cover it. Now, whether that comes directly from sales or whether also you're trying to look at grant funding or tribal funding or tax dollars that are coming in, but being very clear in that model from the beginning and having those conversations about what it's going to take to get to that point where you can pay your bills, cover your staff, keep people there. You know, you know, it's very hard to operate a business if you're only going to operate a few months of the year and keep your staff around. They're going to wander on to other projects. They're going to do other things or your good people are, are going to get hired away by your competitors. You know, at the end of the day. So if you want to keep people home, grow that business and grow that community, because at the end of the day, that's what we're, we're trying to look at with that is that community growth through that. You know, the cooperative itself is a tool, not an end game. But trying to look at how we're, how we're building that on the meat processing side, a couple of things that I wanted to put out from you know both successes and failures. You want to be sure that you can operate year round. You know you've got a big you've got a big plant there. A rule of thumb is you want to have it operating at about eighty five percent capacity of the whole year. You know people are doing you know grass fed or range fed. If you're looking in the background of my picture, you know. And, you know, everybody wants deliberate things for the fall season. Nobody wants to deliver during January and February when it's cold and animals are losing weight with that level. But making and setting up your structure to accommodate that seasonality within there and working with the fairness. And remember, you know, fair isn't always equal of that thing. So it may be incentivizing people to drop things off during the winter time make those animals come, make that process happen to flow through, you know, dealing with things of legitimate interest like, you know, deer or other, or other seasons when you're looking at it, you know, you know, if you can look at things, for, for example, if you're going into poultry processing, can you do some, you know, local slaughter facilities, perhaps even some mobile on that level. Mobile is a lot more complicated when you're looking at the larger animals, the regulatory process. There are a few cases of that, but not very many, and it often gets really complicated. Looking at mobile, I know lots of people come in the door with that's their first interest with there. And also, you know, think about the labor. You know, in the long run, your labor cost is going to be the level that gets you there and getting a labor force that you can train, retain, you know, and gain with that to work through. You know, your, your plant processing may be, a, you know, a few million dollars, but very quickly your labor cost is going to exceed that. So looking at that and thinking about your labor and how you're going to use it, how you're going to train and grow that and the complications that are growing with that. If you're looking at a multi-species facility, it's a lot more complicated on your cutters to have to cut different animals on each time as opposed to having somebody trained to do you know, one specific animal, whether they're doing bison or beef. But if you're going from bison to beef to sheep to, to deer, that takes a higher level skill getting that training, getting that, you know, and paying folks for that with a higher level skill, typically you're looking at a higher, higher cost. So that's on the indigenous, on that side with it. Also, like I say, the more smoking, the more curing, the more cutting you can do into things, the combining, 
products with it. So combining your beef with, you know, vegetables or other productions or getting things where you can build that brand about what you're providing, you know, and providing so you're making deliveries. So you're, you know, the whole thing is if you can make your trucks full and make it run, the more efficiency. On local things, you're often, you're, you know, efficiency was the word I brought up. You're often going to be trying to find a way to cover from the largest producers. Their plants, you know, per head are going to be more efficient on dollars. So you have to find ways to make some of that up in the pricing or finding consumers that are willing to pay either a higher price or find a way to make that up with the trans, you know, transportation savings or other efficiencies or finding products that they're not providing in the market, whether it be cuts or unique or unique products for there. So those were my things on looking at that, you know, the food hub side about tying it together. And we've done lots of work on food hubs and a lot of it's on the USDA um, sites with that. And there's uh, you know, a series of four documents on, you know, starting food hubs and working with that that we helped to author. I would just say, you know, looking at some of that would be a good way to do. Those aren't particularly focused on indigenous, but a lot of the same problems you have to solve, no matter what type of community you're going into, you just sometimes on the indigenous, you're adding more complication to the, to the soup within there. And the other thing I wanted to mention, um, and it was alluded to about a couple of quick funding sources on the process is one area for looking at, and I know Dr. Merrigan mentioned this feasibility studies and that, but for some of this initial planning money, one of the places that's been nice has been the USDA value added grant program has up to $100,000 for feasibility studies on that. Also, and that's out of rural development, out of the AMS program, there's the LFPP, the Local Food Promotion Program, also has some funding for planning and other side on that. That can be a good way to get some of that initial capital to put the details together and begin to flesh out after you have those initial meetings as you're putting some meat on the bones and looking at it. And the other thing, like I say, working that, and I wanted to really, you know, um, reiterate what uh, Chris had said about having that ability to maintain as uh, different groups and different, you know, if one band is losing an election, you want to be sure that you can have the leadership within your operation to make that sustain and the focus and focus on what you're doing and, you know, thinking about the community, but also thinking about the fact that whether you're a co-op or other size, you have to pay, have to pay your bills and you have to move that forward while you're doing it. And, you know, bringing people together to share and do that is a great way to start. With that, I'm going to be quiet and throw it up for questions and the other panel members. With that. Great. Thanks, Jim. Good points. Um, yeah, we all have to be able to pay our bills if you're going to have an operation that works. I will say um, in some circumstances, some tribes have found the value um, in their ag operations to warrant and justify a tribal subsidy through tribal funds. So they may offset the labor costs by covering, you know, um, employment labor associated with that so that they can get um, access to the products or, um, you know, outcomes that they are looking for. So there are combined models, um, not always just revenue driven, but yes, you do have to pay your bills and where that money comes from is important. Um, and, and how you and, and from a labor standpoint, I often think of these uh, food projects as being non-point um, rural development generation. Because often at the hub or at the processing plant, there may be just a limited number of jobs at that one place. But when you look at the impact of the whole community, when you start including drivers and sellers and stores, you create just a very large impact. And Chris can talk to that much better. He's lived it. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a definite ripple effect for the investments that are made in Indian country. I want to turn it over to um, or open it up for the questions that have been submitted in the chat and that are on um, the Google Docs. The first one we have was um, where where we could find a list of indigenous cooperative producers across the United States. I am not particularly aware of a consolidated list. I know that Intertribal Ag Council um, has a lot of producers that they work with, especially those with the American Indian Food Certification Program. But I'd love to open it up to our panelists to see if um, they have any knowledge about um, where they where a person could find information about um, food producers and uh, cooperatives. Well, I, I know, and I'm forgetting the name, uh, but Janie provided Janie Hip had provided us with. Um, a list of indigenous, it goes down by state with indigenous food projects. And I'll see if I can pull that up very quickly. It's not specifically cooperatives, but um, I think it would be very helpful to try and compile a list of co-ops. Yeah. And the Intertribal Ag Council uh, 
uh, American Indian Foods Program, they do offer that list on their website. So anyone that is registered with them as part of their trademarking program uh, will be listed on their website. Again, that's not cooperatives, that's just uh, uh, tribal food producers. Right, thanks, Chris. Um, and there are a lot of great producers that have um, products available um, to purchase either um, directly through them or you can find out where they retail at. So definitely check that out, um, Intertribal Ag Council, um, American Indian uh, Foods. Um, we I had would another encourage question. also, just think real quick, Carly, you know, any, any of these tribal conferences, any tribal programs, any tribal meetings that you're having, please try to use the tribal food products that are available. You can find yes. that list on uh, Intertribal Ag uh, Council's website. Uh, you, can, you can call or you can reach out, but anything you can imagine is being produced in Indian country right now. You can make a lot of different meals out of the foods that are being, and they'll ship it to you. I have direct experience putting large meals together for thousands and you can get products shipped to you from anywhere and you can put phenomenal meals together with tribal food products. So please think about that when you're putting on your conferences and your meetings and, and please feed with tribal food products. Sorry, Absolutely. Carly, I had to throw that in there. No worries. Yeah, I appreciate that. We were able to source some indigenous foods um, to do a food demonstration for our virtual youth summit this year. So we were excited about that. Yeah. Um, Whitney dropped the link in the chat. So please, please check that out. Um, our next question is um, whether anybody is exploring or using blockchain technology, not like Bitcoin or currency, but from its um, original or intended use um, as a way to kind of document um, transactions. There has been um, a push for that. Shannon Farrell at Oklahoma State University um, is doing work in implementing blockchain technology into agricultural operations. And I think there's a particular applicability for blockchain technology, especially when it comes to traceability. Um, so we have a lot of opportunity to be looking at that. And as you are scaling up your production and are working in cooperatives, it could be very beneficial to have a, a traceability program in place, um, even one that implements or utilizes blockchain technology to make that work. Um, I will open it up to the rest of our panelists and see if they have any insights as far as um, any knowledge they have about uh, entities that are using or considering uh, implementing blockchain technology. I don't have any specific uh, information on blockchain itself, but there are a lot of other things that are coming about to be able to market the, the traceability. Um, in the bison industry, for example, we're working with Herd Dog uh, to put together a traceability program. And, and it's down to, we've actually got an app that uh, producers can use on their phone to track their herd health and marketing and, and all of that. So I think that that's one opportunity. One of the things that I've seen that uh, through the pandemic, you know, the, the whole QR code thing has been around for years and it was seen as this outdated technology that nobody was using. And then here came the pandemic and every time you went into a restaurant, you were going onto the QR code to pull up the menu and, and the like. And so that's a huge opportunity for us to do some marketing and put a face behind the product and that consumers can pull up and use that QR code to find out where that product is, is coming from. And then I think some of the other things, and I really love what uh, Dr. Merrigan was talking about of working with um, the tribal communities on organic standard, trying to make the USDA organic standards and do some things within the tribal nations that allow us to, to market the, the organic products. Um, because I see some of the certifications as being a way to, um, you know, to identify the authenticity of the product that is going into the marketplace. So I think all of those are some opportunities that don't have some of the complications that blockchain might bring in. Great, great answer. Thanks, Dave. Um, I will again reiterate, um, check out some of the work that Shannon Farrell at Oklahoma State University has been doing. Um, he's also an attorney. Um, and there are some additional comments in the chat as well. So feel free to read through those. Um, I have a question that I wanted to present to the panelists um, in the meantime. We were, we're talking about food hubs and cooperatives and how those can exist at you know, different levels of our food supply chain, uh, whether it's you know, a production or processing or whatnot, 
what opportunities do you see for tribes to really make some impactful investments in uh, different levels along our food supply chain and how they can best work together um, to leverage cooperative resources? I'll take one. That, I'll take a swing at it real quick. Sure. And then tribal trade. I hear I hear tribal trade uh, at every location I go to. Uh, tribes are interested in trading with other tribes. Um, and that doesn't always mean they're interested in joining a cooperative, uh, which, you know, the topic here, which is a whole nother uh, conversation, I think. But tribal trade can be huge. And, you know, whether you're looking at the Southwest, the Northwest, Northeast, um, you know, tribes have food products that they need to get out and they have other needs for products that they want to bring in. So tribal food distribution, tribal food storage, I've heard issues of coal storage. There are a lot of uh, meat, meat packers that are paying for coal storage in other parts of the country uh, and they're willing to pay for that cold storage closer to home. So right. that, but again, this all leads to regional food distribution and right. tying native food products together with tribes so that we can make sure that if you're a fishing tribe, you can get your fish inland and maybe you wanna trade that for beef or nuts or vegetables right. or whatever it is you wanna trade for. But we need that distribution system to be able to get those products from coast to coast and from region to region. So, uh, well, and I was going to reiterate, I was going to reiterate that last mile of distribution. That's <laughs> always that's always the trick is getting it from that warehouse to where the consumer is, and also making sure to use those institutions and tie into those institutions that exist. You know, like I say, if there's a market already there, providing cold storage that can exist along with that market that's already there, because you're you know if you put something out in 120 degree weather during a nice, you know, cool Arizona summer day, by noon you have soup. So making sure you have those cold storages of tying those things in at the macro level and sometimes even simpler things like cool bots and these other lower technology, uh, lower cost technologies is a way to help to preserve that food, maintain that excellent quality because people have done the stewardship of the land and have produced it and then to not have that break in the chain before it can get to the people that want to, that definitely want to eat it. That's right. Dave, anything to add on that? No, I think they hit it very well. Great. I know we kind of talk about, you know, uh, Chris had mentioned it earlier that if you build it, they will come, not always being a concept that's necessarily applicable in Indian country or, or agriculture for that matter. You really have to consider your markets and your input and demand availabilities. Um, but I kind of wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to talk about, um, you know, the chicken and the egg perspective. You know, if you develop, will you be able to attract and um, uh, expand um, upstream and downstream market opportunities. So if you build a processing plant, will you be able to encourage and support your local producers to expand more? If you have a distribution facility, are you going to be able to attract and serve additional people from a retail perspective? So kind of want to turn that over and hear a little bit of discussion about, you know, how those opportunities work and interact with each other. Well, I think Carly, that's a really good point because um, you know, do a lot of feasibility studies and it, and it tends to be well, we think we've got this product, so let's build a plant and we'll figure out you know, what to do with the market. And really when it comes to, to doing this, I always look at it at three parts, two of them being the bookends. Number one is you know, figuring out what does a, a tribe produce or what do those producers grow and how do they grow it and what are some of the protocols that they, they use and, or might be able to use that we give it. But the second part is what is the, the market opportunity? And of course, when it comes to uh, tribes, it's, you know, the market opportunity, how do we address our food sovereignty needs, but what's the opportunity to take those products into a bigger marketplace? And then when we have those two bookends, then it's, what is that middle piece? Do we need to build a bricks and mortar processing plant? Or is there a way to do a joint venture with somebody else and, and figure all of that out? And so, you know, that's why I spend the, the time on, on those bookends. I'll, and I'll just take an opportunity to do a shout out right now that um, Native American Agriculture Fund is, has made a significant investment in getting access to some of the market data that's out there into the retail marketplace. 
that can help you know tribes as they're developing these projects figure out what are the what are the products that are moving and what's growing and what's not and what are the the positioning that they have and so it's a a great resource that's out there right now great thanks dave uh chris or jim i was going to say part of that too is as you're doing that and dave alluded to that and we mentioned it before is building that brand as a key part of what you're trying to do and I always throw the example out at the end of the day, you know, wine is just rotted grape juice. You know, it's brought in a very specific way, but people are getting, you know, sometimes, you know, hundreds of bottles. And, you know, often the wine that goes into the grape juice is less expensive per bottle than the bottling and label that goes into it mm -hmm. on the things we're buying. And that's not specifically what we're talking about, but it's building that brand, taking that image, taking advantage of those pieces you have and thinking about that, of that piece of, you know, the consumer and what do they want. And it, like I say, and it may be providing a slightly different product that's not out there on the market or how can you adapt to change what it is, you know? Um, you know who would have thought, flaming, you know, who would have thought Flaming Hot Cheetos, you know? <laughs> when we were thinking about things, or, or Taquitos, you know? Areas that we're looking about that are there when you see it, it seems so obvious, but huge market and brands going there, no matter what the story behind the creation was. But, you know, but thinking about that market and how you can build it and how you can grow. And I would say the other piece is on what you're doing with this infrastructure is, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, you know, get out there at a level that makes sense and start trying to arrange sales to do it. You know, make yourself real in the marketplace at a level that you can learn and make some small mistakes. You don't have to bet literally the farm or the community on your first sale. So get out there and grow and learn. And, you know, the opportunities will develop as you learn. Great, Chris. Last words. Yeah, one of the things I was going to add is don't be afraid to start small. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some some people want to really start big, and and uh, you know, it's a, it's a sink or swim method, and unfortunately, sinking hurts, uh, costs a lot of money, and those are the hard lessons you don't want to have to uh, take on. But a lot of tribes have a, have really a small need in the big picture. If they want to process ten animals a year or twenty animals a year, you don't need a big processing plant thirty thousand feet to be able to do that. Uh, if you want to be able to train people, if you want to be able to process for your own people, process your own tribal farmers and ranchers, you can do that in a small facility. So really understand what these plants can do, uh, even in the greenhouses. Uh, if you want to start in the greenhouse operations, start with a small one. Figure out how much you can grow per square foot, because that's how these uh, facilities are measured. Uh, you, you can grow a lot of products in a small facility. So, and as, as you're growing, starting small, you're training people, you're keeping your operational costs lower, uh, you know, and, and you can train people and grow and, and do a lot of good things for a lot of good people.